wonderful pastor with his beautiful family are on vacation, and they'll be back next week. So I am the stand-in today, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I trust that the Lord will bless your hearts as we study God's word. So let's get started. First of all, <laughs> I forgot, my name's Ralph Phelan. I'm one of our deacons here. So, the title of my message is, and some of you have heard me say this before, this was no surprise to the Lord. And hopefully that will become a phrase for you, and it will become part of your everyday uh, feeling towards God. So, today we're going to examine God's character, his attributes, and his redemptive plan for mankind. We're going to review God's plan and purpose for his holy angels and the history of the great rebellion led by Satan. We're going to learn what the Bible teaches about man's spiritual condition and purpose. And we're going to see the two greatest acts of love performed for our sake before the creation of the world by our loving God. It has pleased our loving triune God to reveal himself to mankind over the past 6,000 years according to the genealogical records found in our Bible. During the first 4,000 years, people knew that God is one. They got this from the book of Genesis and from Moses' writings. The Jewish nation did not recognize that God was a plural being, even though Moses recorded God's words when God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. In the scriptures, God reveals his nature his attributes, and redemptive plan for mankind. In God's sovereign plan, you and I are alive after the Old Testament has been written, after the New Testament has been written. We are living after the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, who proved his deity by rising from the dead. We have the record of Pentecost where the promised Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles' heads in the form of tongues of fire. Jesus had told them personally to remain in Jerusalem until the Comforter comes. It has only been approximately 2,000 years that we have known that God is three persons in one being and we call this union, or Godhead, the Trinity. We have more knowledge about God than Moses. The Old Testament prophets searched intently to find out the times and seasons for the prophecies that they were given from the Lord to transmit to us. The scriptures say that angels long to look we are extremely blessed. If you have not thanked God that you are alive in the times that you are now, you certainly should. <coughs> Excuse me. What do we learn from the scriptures about our God? God's greatest attribute is love. His motive for all he does and decrees is love. In 1 John 3, 1, it says this, How great is the love the Father hath lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Moses received the Ten Commandments. They were given to him by God in love to protect us from sinning against him and our neighbor. God lovingly created Adam and Eve to have intimate fellowship with him and enjoy paradise with him in the Garden of Eden. He still desires a personal intimate relationship with mankind. 
This has not changed since the sixth day of creation. God is holy. His motives and actions are pure. In James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, it says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over all of creation, over the heavens, over angels and men. We, have, we see his sovereignty in the messianic prophecies regarding the Lord Jesus and in the prophecies of destruction for the Jewish nation when they fell into idolatry. And we will see his prophecies fulfilled as described in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period. God is all-powerful. He spoke creation into existence. Jesus stopped the waves and the winds with his command on the Sea of Galilee during the most powerful storm the others in the boat had ever experienced. Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the grave after Lazarus had been dead three days. God is immutable. He changes never. He remains holy and pure. His redemptive plan for people has not changed. The method of payment for sins has not changed since the Garden of Eden. God sacrificed two sinless animals from the flock as substitutes to pay for Adam and Eve's sins, and you'll recall they wore the skins. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God is omniscient. He knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future because he will bring it to pass. The Bible tells us God knows the number of hairs on each of our heads. Can you comprehend that? Every human being on the planet, he knows. We cannot comprehend the intelligence and wonder of the God we serve. There are no surprises to our loving God. A biblically accurate statement to make when you run into a non-pleasant surprise, like a flat tire or your transmission goes out on the new car you just bought three days ago and you're in Ohio, is to say quietly or out loud, this was no surprise to the Lord, only to Ralph. Knowing this truth brings peace to my heart at that moment when I'm reminded that God is in charge. Nothing surprises our God. Only Ralph gets surprised. And once I started applying this and realizing that, huh, the only guy surprised is Ralph. Well, if God wasn't surprised, he obviously has a solution. I don't have to get excited and get bent out of shape like I used to do. Our God is absolute in all his attributes. Absolutely loving. Absolutely just. He's absolutely merciful. In fact, he's so loving and merciful we cannot comprehend it because we can't understand eternity with him in heaven as our, our place. God is absolutely full of grace. We know that grace is unmerited favor. Mercy is not receiving the bad we do deserve, which for sinners is eternal hell. Grace is receiving something good we do not deserve. God is absolutely holy in his character. God is immortal. He has always existed. We cannot comprehend that. We are just clay. He is the potter. We are only the clay. 
he lives inside and outside of time. He is called the Ancient of Days, meaning he was alive before days or time existed. The scripture tells us that with God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Now we're going to review what the scriptures teach us about God's kingdom in heaven. There is no sin in heaven. No sin will be allowed to be in heaven. There's only holiness and order and praise given to our worthy Lord. When God created his angels, he gave them free will. Lucifer was the guardian cherub. Michael and Gabriel were archangels. And there were also seraphim and other cherubim. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, it describes God. And it says this, Who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. God lives in unapproachable light. Lucifer was the light bearer. He would take the message from God. So Lucifer's name means light bearer. In layman's terms, Lucifer was the five-star general serving the king of kings, and he would carry God's directives to the subordinate angels, and those angels would carry out God's will. We know of many different angels with different responsibilities. We know of the death angel who killed the firstborn in Egypt, as Pastor Ryan has covered in his study of Exodus. We know from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that angels are sent to minister to those who will be saved. Having a guardian angel is biblically correct. We know that Lucifer was faithful to God for a long period of time. We know that Lucifer told the truth to the rest of the angels for a long period of time. We know that Lucifer was stronger than the other angels and, in Ralph's opinion, probably more intelligent. What happened to Lucifer? Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. <clears throat> In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, chapter 28 has two, uh, two divisions in it. The context is a prophecy against the king of Tyre, who was not a good man. The first 12 verses deal with a direct prophecy against that king. Then we go to midway through chapter 12, and we're going to find a description of Satan. And this is before and when he actually turned and sinned. So starting with mid verse 12, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. The king of Tyre was not in Eden. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz and emerald, crystallite, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. 
Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Satan's downfall came from two sources of temptation. Lust of the eyes, he saw the glory of God, and the pride of life. He was proud. Guess where humans sin? 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things of the world for all that is in the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I would say my number one sin in life is pride. I think I'm the best carpenter in Ionia County, but there's always somebody better than you. Satan committed anarchy in heaven by causing the angels to doubt God's goodness. And I believe Satan promised them a better deal with him than they had with our loving Heavenly Father. When Satan led the revolt, I believe he was convinced of his own power and convinced that he had enough angels to overthrow the God of the universe. How many angels were deceived and believed Satan's lies? Let's turn to Revelation, please. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 12. Starting with verse 3 in Revelation chapter 12. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Guess who that is? The Lord Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be cared for for 1260 days. And here we are in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Many people, including myself, believe that when the scripture says the dragon's tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky, I understand that to be a third of the angels followed Satan. And two-thirds remained loyal. So, all these years and years and years, which we don't know, Lucifer, prior to his sin, led all the angels Lucifer had never lied to the angels. They trusted him, and rightfully so, out of experience. So, why didn't all the angels follow him? Well, let's turn to 1 Timothy together. We're going to 1 Timothy chapter 5. The context of the book of Timothy is the Apostle Paul teaching Timothy how to be a pastor. What the ordinances are, what he should do, what he shouldn't do, what he should guard against, what doctrines. And so in chapter 5, verse 21, he's telling him how to operate as a pastor. And he says this in 
And this is very serious that he says to Timothy, I charge you in the sight of God and Jesus Christ and who? The elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. God, who knows all and has foreknowledge, preempted Satan's rebellion. God knew the rebellion was coming. God allowed the rebellion to occur. And in God's foreknowledge, he sealed a certain number of angels. He elected them and sealed them in holiness and loyalty. And the rebellion was no surprise to our loving, our loving and sovereign God. So when did the rebellion take place? The rebellion took place after the creation of the world and the creation of Adam and Eve. How do we know this? The scripture just said he was cast down to earth. Earth had to exist. So Satan had sinned and was cast out of heaven along with the fallen angels. His experience just taught him that sin will cause eternal judgment and separation from our holy God. Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, Eden wanting, to, wanting her to sin, and when she did, I personally believe that Satan expected God to immediately expel her from the Garden and execute eternal judgment based on what just happened to him. Eve doubted God's goodness and believed Satan's lie. On the other hand, Adam chose to sin. He disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. And that is why throughout the New Testament, we read of the sin of Adam. Eve sinned first. She was lied to, deceived, schnookered. Eve had the same weakness that the fallen angels had. That weakness was their innocence. They had never been schnookered, lied to, deceived before. Sin <coughs> eternally separates people from our holy God. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How is it that we have all sinned? Romans 5, 12 summarizes it and says this, Therefore, as sin entered the world through one man, who was that man? Adam. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. If you have a human mom and a human dad, and I know you do, you inherit their physical characteristics and appearance. You also inherit original sin. Let's go to Psalm 51 next. Psalm 51 was written by King David. And we are in verse 5 of Psalm 51. It says this, David is speaking, and he says, Surely I was sinful at birth. At birth, nine months after conception. He, let me read it again. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The moment of conception, original sin passes into your soul. So, the natural question would be, 
why didn't Jesus have original sin when he was totally human? He did not have a human dad. The scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary and she became pregnant with the Lord Jesus as her baby. Jesus was totally human, but he was sinless. And not only sinless, he kept the entire Mosaic law. Never, ever broke a law. The only human being, even though he's God, who ever fulfilled the entire law. The rest of us could not keep the law, period. <clears throat> Our loving Heavenly Father preempted eternal judgment on of all mankind that Satan caused in the garden by tempting even to sin. Now we have come to the two greatest acts of love God performed before creation on our behalf. Two things he performed. He preempted Satan again. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, please. There are no surprises to our loving Heavenly Father. He knew what pair of shoes you were going to wear today. Ephesians 1, starting with verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, that is Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood. Remember the Lord Jesus has sinless blood. Remember in the Garden of Eden there was a sinless substitute, the two animals from the flock. God is carrying on the same procedure. It takes sinless blood and the death of the substitute to pay for sins. Through the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13 next, please. In Revelation, we have a description of what's going to happen in the end times. How terrible it's going to be on humanity because of the rage of Satan and the false prophet and the beast. And now we're in chapter 13, starting with verse 8. This is describing what's happening during the tribulation period. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belong to the lamb that was slain before the creation of the world. God exists inside and outside of time. We've just learned that not only was Jesus crucified in the confinements of earthly time, but he was crucified outside of time before time existed, before creation. Again, God preempted the eternal judgment that would fall upon us because of sin. So, when was the Lord Jesus crucified? Before the creation of the world, the scripture teaches us. So man has a problem, a big problem. 
we have a problem with sin. And if it is not resolved, it will be resolved in eternal condemnation and hell fire for each individual who has not accepted the payment that the Lord Jesus has made. So what is God's solution to man's sin problem? In his great love, he sent his one and only son to die on a cross, shedding his sinless blood to redeem us from eternal hell. Jesus is the acceptable sacrifice to justify the payment for sins. He is our sinless substitute. There is a cost to your salvation, but it is not monetary. God the Father bore the greatest cost. The cost to God the Father was the death of his one and only son in your place. The cost to you is your pride. I want to encourage those of you who do not yet know the Lord Jesus as your Savior to get alone today or tonight and humble yourself before our loving God and confess your sins to him and ask Jesus to save your soul. And if you do that, that will take you right back figuratively to the Garden of Eden with a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. The payment has already been made. This is my final question. Is there any reason why you would not want to spend eternity with God in heaven? Let's pray. Lord God, you are so good to us, so loving, so kind, so merciful. And you've given us the plan for salvation, to plan to restore our relationship to you and to satisfy your just requirement for sin. Lord God, we trust that your Holy Spirit works in our hearts, that you would grow the believers here and that you would draw the unsaved to yourself so that you would receive all the glory which is your due. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.